From the 1980s to the 1990s, one man prowled Interstate 65, which runs north-south from Chicago, Illinois to Mobile, Alabama. He targeted young female clerks operating front desks at cheap motels during overnight shifts. For years, he assaulted and attacked random women before disappearing into the anonymity provided by the interstate. Some investigators believe there are still countless unsolved crimes that have yet to be connected to him. The following is the story of the Days Inn Killer, also known as the I-65 Killer. Vicki Heath was a 41-year-old divorcee and mother of two. She had spent most of her life in Hardinsburg, Kentucky, but she had recently moved just 35 miles to the west. She had married and raised two kids before divorcing, and she had chosen Radcliffe, Kentucky to start a new life with her fiancé. She had taken a job at a Super 8 motel in neighboring Elizabethtown. The building was positioned near a truck stop in a day's inn. Vicky was the night auditor, a position that would attend to the front desk and monitor the hotel before reporting to the manager in the morning. She enjoyed this time to herself, which she spent reading romance novels. On February 20th, 1987, Vicky started her shift and the motel manager left at 11 p.m. Although it was a Friday, there was less than half occupancy that night. In the early morning hours, a small amount of snow fell on Elizabethtown and it had a peaceful stillness. That all changed shortly before sunup on February 21st. At 6.38 a.m., a guest at the Super 8 called the police with a report. They tried checking out and found the lobby in total disarray. The desk had been swept clean the furniture had been overturned, and the phone had been ripped from the wall. The front clerk was missing, and the building was unattended. Responding officers cleared the scene before leaving out the rear fire exit. The body of Vicki Heath would be found just outside in the back lot. She was on her back in grass that was muddy from snowmelt. Her sweater and plaid skirt were tattered and covered in blood. She had been assaulted, robbed, beaten, and shot twice in the head with a 38 caliber handgun. The lead detective identified a set of footprints leaving the scene, and investigators recovered one of the bullets in the perpetrator's DNA. However, despite the recovered evidence, police struggled to find a suspect or theorize an MO for the crime. Some believed it was a robbery that escalated due to resistance. Others believe it was a targeted assault on a female victim. This crime appeared to be an isolated incident and it would go unsolved. It would take decades for investigators to connect Vicki Heath as the first victim of the I-65 killer. He would go inactive for the next two years until March 3rd, 1989. Margaret Mary Gill was known as Peggy to her friends and family. She was a 24-year-old student at the Sawyer Business College and a night auditor at the Days Inn in Merrillville, Indiana, just a few miles away from where I-65 merges with I-90 near Chicago. Peggy was a shy and soft-spoken woman still living at home with her parents. She chose night shifts. 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. because it was quieter and she wouldn't have to interact with as many clients. On March 2nd, she was finishing a cake for her father's birthday party the next day. They talked briefly before the beginning of her shift. It would be the last time the two would talk. The Days Inn, where Peggy worked, was a two-story building in the shape of a U. The corporate staff had classified this location as low security risk, although it had already been robbed three times previously. 
Nearly an hour after the beginning of her shift, Peggy contacted her general manager to report that the evening had been uneventful. She was confirmed to have checked in a guest at 1.30 a.m., her last for the night. Less than 30 minutes later, a college student entered the lobby, which appeared deserted. He waited for five to 10 minutes, and when no one appeared, he left for another hotel in the area. Peggy missed her scheduled check-in with the general manager at 5 a.m. An hour later, she was reported missing to the Merrillville Police Department. Responding officers encountered multiple guests in the lobby waiting for service. They found Peggy's belongings, a purse, and car keys behind the front desk with no sign of a struggle. They contacted her parents by phone, and when the manager arrived at 6.30 a.m., she unlocked the front office to discover the cash register had been pried open and emptied. Later, an audit would reveal that $179 had been stolen. With evidence of a robbery, police began to search the building. Indiana State Police searched a vacant wing which had been closed for remodeling. Near the fire exit, they found the nude body of Peggy Gill, her uniform neatly folded beside her. She had been assaulted before she was shot twice in the back of the head with a 22 caliber pistol. Investigators found fingerprints at the scene, but they weren't matched with any records. It was speculated that the perpetrator forced Peggy to identify a vacant area to commit his assault, and she complied to avoid violence. Again, investigators struggled to theorize an M.O. Some speculated that this was a targeted robbery and assault, and the college student who came to the lobby initially became an early suspect. They were reluctant to let go of any lead, It wouldn't take long for investigators to discover that another female motel clerk had been abducted in Remington, Indiana on the same night, just 52 miles south on I-65. They suspected it was a spree killing. Within a few weeks, ballistics confirmed their suspicions and they began to connect the murder of Peggy Gill with that of Jean Marie Gilbert. Remington, Indiana was less than an hour away from Merrillville and just 30 miles away from Delphi. It was a small truck stop town, the kind that pepper most interstates. It was composed of gas stations and budget hotels kept alive by commuters and truck drivers. The Sunset Inn was formerly a day's inn and it abutted a parking lot reserved for semi-trailer trucks. A few fast food restaurants and a Super 8 were nearby. Jean Gilbert was 34, recently divorced and a mother of two. She attended college for a business degree and she worked evenings at the Sunset Inn after class. She wasn't scheduled to work on March 2nd, but she had switched shifts to cover for one of her coworkers. Her night started at 11 p.m. and it was slow. She spent her time on schoolwork in a small room off the front office. At 4.30 a.m., she conducted a wake-up call for a guest. Police believe that shortly afterward, a man entered the lobby and baited Gilbert out of the office under the guise of an emergency. Then, he restrained her after a surprise attack. He pried open and emptied the cash register before escorting Gilbert through a side exit and into his vehicle. He immediately wheeled back onto I-65 and headed south before taking exit 188. At 6.30 a.m., a farmer reported hearing two gunshots. 30 minutes later, Gilbert was reported missing as multiple guests attempted to check out from the Sunset Inn but found the night auditor was missing. Responding deputies were forced to wait an additional 30 minutes for the manager to arrive and unlock the door to the lobby. They found Gilbert's belongings in the side room, her purse, keys, and school books. After a brief audit, they determined that $247 had been taken from the register. Simultaneously, a farmer discovered the nude body of Gilbert nearly 19 miles away. 
Arriving investigators found her face down in a frozen ditch, wearing only her shoes and socks. It was determined that she had been assaulted, and a DNA sample was recovered. It would later be matched to the sample recovered from Peggy Gill, irrefutably linking the two murders to the same perpetrator. The cause of death was three shots with a 22 caliber pistol, two delivered to the back of the head. A task force was assembled, including the FBI and departments from all counties with identified victims. Despite their collaboration, they struggled to compile a profile. The seemingly random nature of these attacks and the sprawling hunting ground proved to be a unique challenge for investigators. Just as it would be years later for investigators of the I-70 killer, they had to contend with the anonymity of the interstate. Nine months later, another attack would occur. Only this time, the victim would survive. On January 2nd, 1990, a fourth incident occurred. The name and details of this victim have not been released to the public for fear of reprisal against her or her family. She was a 21-year-old night auditor working at the Days Inn in Columbus, Indiana, located a little more than three hours south on I-65 from the previous victims. Around 5 a.m., what was described as a stereotypical looking blue collar trucker entered the lobby of the motel. He wore blue jeans, flannel, and a stocking cap with medium length brown hair. And he had bright green eyes that almost appeared yellow. Notably, the right eye was lazy. He asked for change for the cigarette machine which the night auditor provided. She recommended a few places to eat nearby and the man left. However, he returned shortly after with a hot coffee in a foam cup, again requesting change, this time for the soda machine. When she opened the cash register, he threw hot coffee into her eyes. While she was blinded, he quickly jumped the counter, wielding a six-inch brown-handled knife telling her, quote, I won't hurt you if you keep your mouth shut. Give me all the money, unquote. He emptied the register before robbing her of the money from her purse and jewelry from her fingers. Then he escorted her to a rear fire escape. There, he assaulted the woman. After, they entered the parking lot where he instructed her to keep walking. He followed behind her as they crossed the pavement. And on the other side, she descended the embankment and continued until she found a trailer home and called for help. The man was nowhere to be seen. The victim was taken to nearby Bartholomew County Hospital for recovery, and DNA evidence from the perpetrator was recovered. A description of the killer was quickly generated into a police sketch and released by the Columbus Police Department. However, this was done without consulting the task force and perhaps due to political fallout, the Indiana Task Force did not use this description to generate their own composite until 15 months later. This time, the sketch was developed in color. Decades after these attacks, a DNA sample would link a fifth incident with the others. Again, very few details have been released to protect the surviving victim. In 1991, a woman in Rochester, Minnesota was assaulted and stabbed. However, she managed to escape with her life. The description of her attacker was nearly identical to the sketch of the I-65 killer. She described him as being of average height with gray-brown hair and green eyes. She confirmed that his right eye was lazy. DNA evidence confirms that these five victims suffered at the hands of the same perpetrator. Shockingly, this does not conclude the list of potential victims. The unnamed victim in Minnesota indicates that the hunting grounds for this serial killer may have been much larger than previously considered. There may be countless other cold cases that simply have not been linked yet. 
two of these cases are the murders of Lois Evelyn Wright and James Matthew Walton. Evelyn Wright had an associate's degree from a local college. She had married Daniel Wright, and the two had four daughters. She worked the December 17th to 18th overnight shift at the Colonial Inn in Rockford, Illinois. Usually, she called to wake her husband before his shift at 6 a.m. On the morning of December 18th, 1988, she failed to call him. When he phoned her, they spoke for a few brief minutes. It would be the last time Daniel Wright would speak with his wife. About an hour later, a guest entered the lobby attempting to check out, and they found Evelyn unconscious and face down. Responding paramedics thought she suffered a cardiac event, and as they began chest compressions, they identified a gunshot wound to the right side of her chest. At that point, they stopped and attempted to preserve the scene. The cash register had been pried open and emptied, leading investigators to believe it was a robbery gone wrong. She had been shot with a 44 caliber Magnum less than a year after the murder of Vicki Heath. A few days later, investigators would connect a second crime to this perpetrator. It was Saturday, December 31st in 1988 when James Walton was working an overnight shift at the Envoy Inn. It was a prime location just off Interstate 71. A guest spotted Walton talking to a dark-haired woman when a man entered the lobby. He stood over six feet tall with a heavy build, and he was between the ages of 30 and 40. He had red-brown hair and a flannel shirt. Shortly after he was spotted, guests heard a commotion in the hallway before hearing gunshots in the parking lot. Walton was discovered outside, having been shot multiple times in the torso. Investigators speculate that the register was emptied at 6.24 a.m. due to recorded transactions. In March 1989, forensics matched the 44 Magnum bullet fragments found in James Walton to those found on the scene of the murder of Evelyn Wright. Some investigators believe these two cases are not connected to the I-65 serial killer. Others are not so sure. Over the years, police began to tie these cases together and establish a rudimentary profile. First, theorists posited that the killer was clearly proficient with firearms. Over the years, he had utilized 22, 38, and 44 caliber pistols. He was comfortable with weapons and knew where to easily exchange them. Second, the descriptions of the perpetrator were remarkably similar among eyewitnesses. They described a man who appeared to be a trucker, wearing jeans and flannel with dark red hair. He was taller than average with a heavy build, and almost all descriptions included a lazy eye. Third, the victimology of these cases was hauntingly similar. The perpetrator targeted young women at budget hotels in the early morning hours. He would surprise, detain, assault, and murder his victims, stealing only small amounts of money from the register. Despite fiery media scrutiny, multi-agency task force, and surviving eyewitnesses, the I-65 killer remained uncaught for decades. That is, until April 2022, when police agencies announced that they had discovered his identity through investigative genealogy. DNA samples were compared to those in genealogical databases, and investigators discovered with a 99.99% certainty that the killer was Harry Edward Greenwell. Born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1944, his criminal history began at 18 when he was arrested for armed robbery in January 1963. He was sentenced to two years of reformation and five years of probation. Just two years later, he was arrested for a sexual crime. 
While the judge was dismissing the charge, Greenwell kicked the wire screen from the window and jumped from the second floor of the fiscal court building. His escape attempt didn't last long as he was quickly apprehended the next day at a restaurant in the Greyhound bus stop and returned to the courthouse. His probation was revoked and he was forced to serve his sentence until being released in 1969. Sometime in the early to mid-70s, he married Terry Jo Hastings, his first wife and mother of his children. Tragically, she would die in a house fire in 1978, just 23 years old. Greenwell was a traveling railway worker at this time, and he was on the opposite side of the state at the time of the fire. This incident was ruled an accident by the local fire department. Greenwell would remarry a year later, and then in 1982, return to a life of crime. He was arrested for a burglary committed in Iowa, where he stole 40 batteries from the village farm and home store in Lansing. However, he escaped the Alamaki County Jail on June 17th during breakfast, but he was quickly captured later that day after police searched with bloodhounds and helicopters. Just nine days later, Greenwell escaped from the facility again. He would be caught on June 30th after a witness recognized him from a wanted poster. His escape attempts would net him two years of additional prison time. Three weeks after the attacks on Gill and Gilbert, he would break into the home of his second wife. They were on and off again, and at this time, they had become estranged. Greenwell and his second wife had planned to move into a new home together, but she was withdrawing from the marriage and Greenwell himself. When she wasn't at their new home, he went to his mother-in-law's home, kicked the door in, and dragged her into the street. During his attack, he choked and threatened her. Wisely, she feigned injury and eventually made it to the hospital, where she later reported the incident to police. Greenwell was arrested a short time later on possible charges of false imprisonment, battery, criminal damage, and criminal trespassing. Just two days later, he was arrested again for another altercation with his estranged second wife at a local tavern. Then, in 1998, Greenwell was stabbed by his 15-year-old stepdaughter, Ava Smith. As a consequence, he was arrested for being a felon in possession of a firearm. As described in the 1990 assaults, Greenwell detained his victims by wielding a knife. Some researchers have raised questions about this incident as revealing of his MO. Had he attempted to control his stepdaughter at knife point? And did police recover one of the murder weapons unknowingly when they seized his illegal firearm? Shockingly, this case was later dismissed and all charges were dropped. In 2013, just three years after retiring from his position with the railway, Greenwell died. A little less than a decade later, he would be identified as the I-65 killer. Many believe that the coming decades will reveal even more victims, and some have begun to make those connections already. Shockingly, the I-65 killer closely resembles the previously profiled I-70 killer. Both were white men, near 40 years of age, with red-brownish hair, and a familiarity with firearms. Additionally, the victimology, timeline, and killing methods are a close match between the two predators. The I-70 murders occurred just two years after the last confirmed victim of the I-65 killer. Interstate highways helped obscure and hide the I-65 killer for decades. Now that he's been identified, many struggle to redefine justice and cope with the fact that he will never have to answer for his crimes. Worryingly still, there could be countless other victims who simply have not yet been connected. This monster may have been stopped, but we have yet to realize the aftermath of his passage.